Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second session of the AirShaper feature update event. <coughs> My apologies. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll wait just a few more minutes until everyone has joined. Um, in the meanwhile, maybe a short overview of what we will be discussing today. So we have an update on rotating elements, which can be either rotating wheels on cars to take into effect um, the pressure buildup and so on inside the wheel wells. We can also discuss, or we will also discuss, the rotating propellers where actually the goal is to analyze the thrust and the torque and the flow pattern around the propellers, mainly to see what the impact will be on the flow around the main body of the drone to see what the lift and drag in total will be. And we will also discuss aerodynamic shape optimization, which is a technique where the software will automatically morph or actually reshape the 3D model um, to improve towards a certain goal, which you can set yourself, which can be either the reduction of drag, which is the most common one, or to increase downforce on race cars, or to increase lift on planes, or even lift over drag ratios, or even the torque values around a certain geometry. And last but not least, we will also cover adaptive mesh refinement techniques, as you can see here, which will allow you, or actually the platform will automatically allow that for you, to spend the cell budget in the most efficient way um, to have the highest level of accuracy for a given cell budget. So let's get started and welcome everybody to uh, this second webinar on the feature update for Airship. The first one is rotating elements, and we will start with rotating wheels on cars. We have a separate video on this topic, if you like, uh, to understand what the mathematics are behind different ways of modeling rotation in CFD, which is computational fluid dynamics. In this session, we will not dive into too many details, but we will actually check the main differences between a rotating wheel and a rotating propeller. So as you can see on the left, we have the rotating um, condition for a wheel, which is called a rotating wall boundary condition. And basically this is one of the most basic forms of adding some level of rotation to your simulation. Um, in this case, what happens is that the numerical code will on the surface of any patch or, or uh, part of the surface mesh uh, that is rotating, it will add a additional constraint that will tell the software to treat it as something which has a rotational velocity, which is equal to the rotational velocity multiplied by the radius. So the further you go out, the higher the velocity, just like on a normal wheel. And then this will be taken into account by the calculation software, um, which in will increase the pressure, for example, and it will change the surface friction and the flow line pattern on the surface of the wheel. So let's have a look at how this can be set up in AirShaper. So while this is loading, maybe a short note on what we do when a 3D file comes. So while this model is loading, actually what our platform will do is to auto automatically split any 3D model, which we accept in STL format, um, we will split it automatically into separate components. So even though you will export a full assembly, which can have hundreds or even thousands of parts at AirShaper, even though you will export it as a standalone single STL file, we will again split it once it comes in, which will allow you to set rotating wheels. Um, on this one, we first will set the normal simulation parameters. This one is on the ground moving through air. Uh, let's say we go for a hundred kilometers per hour. And this car is 4.4 meters long, so 4,400 millimeters. Once this is all set, you will be able to actually click the rotating wheels button. And this will give you an interface that uh, requires you only to select the tires of the wheels. Because when you select the tires, we will automatically select the center of rotation um, and so on. So we'll just go ahead and click the four tires of this car. And as you can see, what happens is that the software automatically detects the central axis of rotation of each wheel. So no longer will you have uh, to come back after a few days of, of simulation and, and only to notice that uh, the sense of direction of rotation was wrong or the coordinate system was not going through the center of the wheel and so on. Also, the 
rotational speed of the wheel is automatically linked to the forward driving speed of the car. So you don't have to worry about that one either. So this is done all automatically. Um, and any components that are included within, let's say, the space around the tire with a bit of extra margin for wheel rims sticking out a bit will be included automatically, uh, including the uh, brake discs and so on. So you don't have to worry about that selection method either. Now, once the simulation is done, we can have a look at the results. So this is your normal air shaper interface. So while the results are loading, um, and by the way, we will discuss this later on as well, but you can now also share projects uh, with customers, with colleagues and so on, simply by adding their email address in this box and hitting the share button, after which they will receive an email uh, um, inviting them to see the results. Also, we will just, something we'll discuss later on as well is the rotation gizmo that allows you actually to uh, change to different views. Um, so if I look at this model, um, the overall flow pat pattern will look similar to a simulation without rotating wheels, only in this case we saw that the um, glide coefficient actually slightly went down for this car. It can go up or down depending on your geometry, depending on the coverage of the wheels and so on. Um, so if you have a nice uh, Tesla Model 3-like wheel cover, of course, you will have a lower impact of rotating wheels, at least on the side, uh, compared to one with an open structure for the wheels. In this case, you can see that um, we have high pressure on the surface of the wheels because we are plotting the total pressure. And because there's extra movement involved, the total pressure goes up on the surface. Uh, still, <clears throat> you're able to see that the um, pressure is actually highest where the air hits the front of the tire, where it is exposed to the free airstream, although it's not free airstream anymore, but the air is able to hit this part of the wheels. And that's why some cars actually have deflectors here, which is something we also optimize for our customers to guide the air underneath, or not underneath, but away from the tire to reduce this um, collision. Uh, what you can also see is that the air inside the wheel wells is actually shielded a bit and you will have lower pressure. Still, relative to the overall pressure, this is higher pressure. Um, and this is what they typically call the pressure buildup inside the wheel wells, uh, which is one of the reasons why they often especially on race cars, um, provide slots here to evacuate or ventilate the high pressure air, which will create more downforce locally um, at the front wheels, for example. Um, what's also important is that once you use our rotating wheel interface, um, because we automatically detect the axis of rotation, we also know the wheelbase, actually, of the car, which allows us to automatically calculate the aero balance by providing you with the front lift coefficient and the rear lift coefficient. So you can see this car actually has quite a lot of downforce at the front of the car, but it has a small bit of lift at the rear of the car, lifting the rear uh, and virtually reducing the weight on the rear axle. Um, now this is quite common. Most cars actually have lift at the rear uh, because of the well, slight low pressure area that they have at the rear as the air tries to close in again and lifts the, the rear of the car. So this is what we do for rotating wheels. If we then go to rotating propellers, we use a slightly more advanced mathematical method to, approx to approximate the rotation of elements. Again, the mesh will still not be really moving. It's still an approximation for a static geometry. But what we do compared to this condition, um, what we do extra is to define a cylindrical space around this propeller. And within this region, we will actually define extra mathematical equations that take into account um, the rotation which will provide you with an approximation of the centrifugal forces and the Coriolis forces within that region, which means that if you have a particle of air going around a circular track at a certain uh, RPM, then it will experience an outward force, for example. And this altogether combined effect will allow you to provide an analysis or, or, or run an analysis uh, to analyze the thrust of a propeller, to analyze the torque vector, uh, torque values, and so on. So how to set this up in Airshaper? Um, the method is actually quite similar. Uh, again, the model will be split automatically upon upload, um, after which you can select the right components for the road. Um, just like with the car, we first need to set the model itself. Uh, so propellers will only work if you 
set it above the ground, even though we, we can also do simulations uh, with ground effect, uh, if that's ever necessary. Um, let's give this a forward tilt. And this is actually a quite a small drone. It's just uh, 20 centimeters long. So I'll select millimeters here and perhaps give it a forward velocity of around seven or five kilometers per hour. With that all being selected, I can now click the button Add Rotating Elements instead of Rotating Wheels, which will again open up an interface where you are simply asked to click on a propeller. Now, a small note um, is that this method is still in beta functionality, which means that we can only support propellers that have been drawn in 3D as a single component. Later on, uh, we can advance that to compellers comprised of multiple components. For now, it's one component. And in the future, we will also add an interactive interface that will provide you for post-processing with the torque and uh, power values per propeller. So you just need to click on a propeller, after which our software will automatically detect the center of rotation. It even works on two-bladed propellers, which is really nice. And if the sense of rotation is wrong, and this is not the real speed, by the way. Otherwise, if it really was 1,000 or 10,000 RPM, you wouldn't be able to see whether it's going left or right or clockwise or counterclockwise. So we slow it down artificially, but during the calculation, we use the real value. Um, this one is going the wrong way, actually. So I can actually hit this toggle and make it spin the opposite direction. I can just continue to click other propellers um, as easy as this and it will automatically start to spin. Again, this one needs to spin the opposite direction. And as you can see, it automatically copies the RPM value that was used uh, for the first uh, propeller. Uh, because usually, um, if you click on multiple propellers, they're going in the same at the same speed. This one is, are, is already going in the correct direction, as is this one. So once everything is done, that's it. Um, so if you run a regular simulation, you can add this rotating wheels or rotating propellers at no extra cost. Once a simulation is done, uh, let's have a look at the results. Again, you have the normal um, air shaper interface. This one is a bit uh, heavier to load. There's lots of turbulence going on um, because the propellers really um, mess up the flow in, in, in a way. Um, so what we'll see here is actually wingtip vortices. So you can see it's quite a dramatic flow pattern. Um, if we zoom in, we can see that we have um, the uh, the trailing vortices here or, uh, that are caused by the wingtips passing by and so on. Um, you can even see, because this one still had a ground nearby, that we have some kind of um, effect when the air hits the ground where you also have pressure loss. Um, you can see these large swirls of flow uh, coming out of the propellers. You can even see large um, energy loss or pressure loss around the main body of the drone, which is actually what we're looking for. So the goal of this methodology is not necessarily to super accurately predict the thrust on the propeller. Um, it will be a nice approximation, but the main goal is to see what the overall flow pattern will look like and what the effect is of propellers on the flow around the main body, for example. So that's it for rotating propellers. If we then move to the next topic, um, this is our adaptive mesh refinement, um, which basically means that we run multiple simulations if you order a simulation at Airshaper. We will run a first simulation based on a coarse mesh, which has large cubes, or let's call them 3D pixels, if you like, if you want to make the comparison to uh, a digital photograph. Um, we run that simulation. And then what happens is that we map the flow result data um, onto the mesh, the original mesh that we kept before the model was actually cut out from the mesh. Now, what kind of flow properties do we log? We look at properties that indicate where the flow is actually quite complex and it, where, where it would be beneficial to increase the resolution uh, to get more accuracy, which means that we look at things like vorticity, if you have high um, changes in velocity locally between cells, then vorticity will go up and we can actually capture that. We also look at pressure gradient. Uh, if you have a high pressure buildup at the nose of the car or something or at local edges, um, then we will also capture this. We map the flow fields, set a certain threshold um, above which we will refine the cells. We then do actually refine the cells and then we map it back to the normal calculation and again cut out the model. Now, why do we make this detour instead of just 
refining the mesh around the existing cutout object? Well, we do so because if you refine it around the existing cutout mesh, you don't refine the surface anymore. You just split cells and you don't refer to the original geometry anymore uh, to increase adherence to the original surface. So we refine the mesh before we cut it out, then send it back, then cut it out again to have nice refinement on the surface. Um, now, before we dive into the details of what this looks like, um, for those who have experience with open foam, which is the CFD or computational fluid dynamics library that we use behind the scenes and which we have heavily modified and tweaked and automated, we actually released an open source repository for people to start using and implementing this themselves. So we have a blog detailing everything uh, that is happening. We have a number of experts from within the open foam community who have tried and tested our repository and gave us nice feedback, which you can also read here online. And there's also a link included and a dedicated wiki page uh, on the open foam wiki uh, to detail what's happening with um, this adaptive mesh refinement. So if you have nice ideas, if you have uh, thoughts for contributions, if you want to apply this to, let's say not aerodynamics, but hydrodynamics, or if you want to extend this to compressible flow, anything you like, just let us know and we can see if we can include it in the repository. Um, and also, of course, credit you for that. Um, now let's go back to what this actually looks like. So this is an example of a mesh around the car um, where you can see the full window at the top. And you can see we have lots of spacing here because we typically aim for a blockage ratio of just 1%, which is the ratio of the frontal area of the car uh, divided by the cross-sectional area of the wind tunnel. Um, and our base mesh before refinement, this is not adaptive refinement, this is just the initial mesh. You can see that we refine the mesh as we get closer to the surface of the car to already uh, accurately capture the flow in the first analysis. What we then do after the first run is to refine three steps based on vorticity and one step based on the pressure gradient. So let's go to the first step of vorticity. And what happens is that the wake behind the car, especially the fire field wake here, is being refined a lot because you have the free steam air velocity, which in our case was 100 kilometers per hour. And then you have the wake behind the car, which is dragging air long or virtually in the wind tunnel. This is slower moving air. So in between these layers of air, which are moving at various speeds, you have a shear force, which will trigger uh, the vorticity values to go up. And this actually triggers uh, the refinement, also upstream of the car, where the air slows down as it approaches the nose and so on. Um, I will go to the second refinement now. So you can see that the refinement in the wake, in, in, in the areas where you have the highest vorticity, so not the far, the far, far field, but like something in between, is refined again. Also just behind the car, we see refinement. And if I hit it again, you see that we have even more refinement in the most difficult areas of the wake, which is typically the interface between the free stream air um, and the wake. So there you have a high uh, recirculation and, and, and shear force. Then in the final step, uh, what you can do is look for these areas. These are, for example, the areas where you have the front of the car where the air comes to a standstill. So you have a high pressure gradient as the pressure builds up. You have the roof where the air needs to speed up around the roof um, and this lowers the pressure because of the Bernoulli effect. And you have the area underneath the car where you have the front splitter, smooth underbody and diffuser working together to speed up the air, which also creates um, large changes in pressure. Um, so if I now move to the next one, you can actually see if I go back and forth um, how this is changing, mainly the resolution on the surface of the car. And if I then go to the final step where we cut out the mesh, you can see that we now have a very good correspondence of the new mesh uh, on the surface with the refinement actually being done on the surface itself. And this looks like this on the surface of the car. So what you can see here is that the base mesh already had like two levels of refinement. So one level and a higher level here on the edges. And after refinement, we, you see that we can go to three levels. So you have the coarse one, the mid one, and then you have the highest level uh, really on the locations where the pressure gradient was highest uh, combined with vorticity. Um, for example, this area, this pocket where normally the windscreen wipers are, you have some local recirculation, uh, which means high vorticity, high pressure gradients. As the air hits small sharp edges, you have local um, peaks in pressure 
uh, uh, peaks and lows in pressure. You have the separation at the rear of the car, uh, especially because the, the outwash of the tire is uh, disturbing the flow. So again, these are areas where the software will automatically detect difficult flow patterns and will spend some of the mesh there to improve results. And this is quite different from the industry standard, where you normally start with a geometry and you work your way up in terms of cells, and then you end up with a cell budget. In our case, we do the opposite, because we guarantee a certain fixed pricing, which is only possible if we maintain a more or less fixed number of cells, which means we work our way, we work our way backwards. Uh, if, let's say, for this regular simulation, which is our medium accuracy level, we want to end up with 10 million cells, we could start, for example, with 5 million cells on the surface and volume of the, of the initial mesh, and then, after all those refinements, use another 5 million cells to get to 10 million cells, uh, to get to the final mesh. And basically the idea is that your cell budget, you need to spend it in the most relevant way possible to get the most or the highest accuracy for a given cell budget. So that's our adaptive mesh refinement. The next thing we want to discuss is actually our aerodynamic shape optimization. So you can use AirShaper to analyze your design, tweak it manually, upload a new model and iterate and analyze the results yourself. That's perfectly possible. What's also possible, especially for, especially for clean and smooth surfaces where it's less obvious what to do uh, in terms of achieving a certain goal, like reducing drag, then you can ask our software to automatically morph a software, uh, the surface in 3D to get closer to a certain goal, which can be to reduce drag, to increase lift, to increase downforce, whatever it is that you need. So let's have a look at how this is done at Airshaper. For this example, we used uh, something called the Drive Air model, um, which is a generic car model, uh, which has multiple variants, like a, a notchback, a fastback, and a sedan, um, which is used as an industry in the car, uh, as a reference in the car industry to validate the wind tunnel test data, to validate CFD codes, and so on. Um, so today, let's set it up, and we want to optimize the diffuser for lower drag. So imagine we again go for 100 kilometers per hour. This model is in millimeters. Let's leave the wheels for what they are. We already set those up before, even though you can actually combine it with uh, our shape optimization. And then we have two options to optimize. We have one option to optimize a part, uh, which means you can select one of the split parts, like a mirror or something, and then our software will optimize that full part if it's not too complex. Or you can choose to optimize a region, uh, which means you will get an in interactive interface here, um, where you can draw a box, which is actually your design space. So you're telling the software within this space, you can actually morph the model as you like, um, as soon as, as long as you get closer to my goal. So if you want to optimize the rear diffuser, we may want to change the scale by pressing S, which means we can now squeeze the box a bit. Um, we can also make it a bit shorter like this. I think if I look at it from behind, yes, this is actually way too narrow so if i again make it wider like this and then i can actually press t again for transform and then bring it closer uh, to the rear of the car something like this more or less and you can even add rotation uh, to it as well to make it aligned more with the already uh, upward inclination of the existing diffuser so that's it that's the only thing you need to do and then uh, you can select your goal over here um, we have a few more extra options, but you'll see options to select either drag, lift, lift over drag ratio, or even a moment or torque value as the goal. And then you can choose to minimize or maximize that goal. That's it. That's the only thing you need to do to set up uh, an automated simulation. So if you look at the results of this one, what you will see is that First of all, you get the trusted AirShaper interface, uh, which will show you pressure clouds, uh, surface pressure, and so on, streamlines, uh, all the things that you know. Um, and you will have an extra tab here called optimization, which will show you the way the software is morphing the geometry and how this links to the improvements um, in drag. In this case, you can see that the software makes an improvement, makes another one, jumps up and down again. And overall, um, you're going from a drag coefficient of 0 0.272, which is higher because the wheels are not rotating, um, than the normal one, 2.272 um, to 2.68, which is a nice reduction in drag, actually, um, by adjusting just one part. 
As you can see, the software, if you look at this image, for example, the software is actually pushing the diffuser upward um, to get a better connection of the wake behind the car and the airflow going underneath the car. Um, because the front splitter, the smooth underbody, and the rear diffuser, they're all working together to accelerate the airflow underneath the car. And this airflow actually helps to fill the wake behind the car, reducing the size of the wake. And this is helping to reduce drag. Of course, if you overdo it, you will trigger separation at the rear of the car, and then uh, you can make the drag go up again. So this is all included in the optimization. Now, what's important to note is that um, based on these results, um, you will also get a full 3D model, which you can download here. If you click on optimization data, you can download the optimized 3D model and load it into your own 3D software um, and overlay it with your existing design and then see how you can change your design to make it match this one as closely as possible. Take into, taking into account other constraints like safety, manufacturability, design aesthetics, and so on. So this really serves as a really fast and flexible inspiration to, to show you where you can expect the biggest uh, gains in terms of drag reduction. We can do this on other things than cars, obviously. We also took a publicly available reference model, um, again, a validation standard that is sometimes used uh, in the aviation industry of a Cessna 210J Centurion airplane. We cut, off, we cut off half the wing, more or less. And then we created a design space around the wing tip only to improve the lift on the entire wing. So actually, because the aerodynamics um, around the center part of the wing here are aerodynamically linked to the outer part, if you optimize this part, we can actually increase pressure uh, distribution on this part as well. So if we look at the results, and maybe a small note, even though we optimized for lift, we saw that the drag value was nearly constant. So we saw a very similar improvement in the lift over drag ratio uh, in this case. And this is a very smooth curve showing you that you can go from a lift coefficient of 0 0.85 to 1.25, um, which is, of course, subjective because it's a cutoff wing and so on. Um, but it's a very good uh, improvement ratio, uh, relative improvement ratio. And what you can see is that the software is actually creating a strange bulge here on this uh, wingtip of the aircraft, which then is a very good tool of inspiration to start implementing this and running full simulations on a full airplane, for example, to see what happens. And of course, this is not the final stage. What you would want to do is once you get inspired by this, you create a new shape, and then you can validate whether this shape actually gives you good lift and drag and lift over drag values at different angles of attack, for example, because this is just one set point. Of course, you can also run an optimization on this airplane wing or wingtip at a different angle of attack to begin with and see if there's any differences in terms of what it suggests. So this really helps to speed up the design process um, by suggesting shapes that you may not have come up with yourself otherwise. If I go back to the simulation, we also have uh, examples of this one where we apply, where we apply this to a 3D model, uh, a 3D scan model um, of a Porsche Taycan, for example. Um, and the cool thing about this um, is that if you do it like this, um, this will automatically, um, first of all, analyze the flow results. Uh, so what is happening is that the uh, flow around the car is being modeled as we always do, which means you see the flow streamlines here. Um, then um, you see the pressure clouds where you have energy loss and so on, all directly on a 3D scan of the car, which, would, which has gaps and holes and so on. Our code just works flexibly out of the box. And then within this 3D design space that you see around the trunk, we ask the software to increase downforce. And it's cool to see that actually automatically it creates a ducktail spoiler, uh, something that the Porsche engineers have been applying for years, which is nice to see uh, that our software automatically does what engineers do um, or have been doing for years. Um, that's nice proof of, of without us telling it uh, to do so. A second example of this is 
the Aptera, which is a company in the States, a startup company, producing a solar electric vehicle uh, with a drag coefficient of just around 0.13. And we're helping them to further improve the aerodynamics, again, by applying our aerodynamic shape optimization tool. As you can see, we again optimize the basic flow around the car. <clears throat> which includes the um, streamlines, as you can see here, which again includes the um, 3D pressure clouds and the surface pressure map, as we saw before. And then we optimize the car in, in numerous areas, and we're showing three of them in this video. The first one is actually the wheel cover um, on the left and right wheel at the front. And as you can see here, it pushes out the sides uh, to accommodate the airflow to pass between the body uh, and the wheel arches. And this one is taking away the sharp edge at the rear skirt to guide the air away around the rear tire. And then the software automatically suggested to squeeze the tail of the car to reduce the cross-sectional area and uh, improve uh, the aerodynamics. So if I go back to the presentation, that, that was our second example of how I can really help to reduce drag and inspire designers um, and not just engineers uh, to come up with new concepts. Um, Another one we would like to share is a research we did together with the NTUA, which is the National Technical University of Athens, which are actually the people who developed this code from scratch. Uh, well, who developed it a long time ago, I think together with Volkswagen, and then um, transferred it to the open source open foam uh, software library. And together with them, we again took a highly detailed 3D scan of a car, a Volkswagen ID3 in this case. They used the mesh that was generated by the AirShaper algorithm. They ran simulations until uh, results converged and then started to run um, iterations, again by defining a design space. And as you can see, after cycle 13, the drag was reduced by a little over 5%, which is really, really a lot on a, on a production car. Now, obviously, the suggested shape would not be implemented straight away by Volkswagen because aesthetically it's probably not very pleasing. It takes away the rear view. Um, it's probably too expensive, a curved glass like this at the rear and so on. But the point is this really helps designers at Volkswagen and other companies to get inspired <clears throat> really quickly. They can quickly understand um, if there's maybe 1% or 7% of aerodynamic drag reduction potential at the rear of the car, at the diffuser, at the front, at the sides, at the mirrors, and so on. Um, and because you can use a 3D scan directly, you can also apply this to cars of competitors and so on uh, to really understand how they are tackling aerodynamics. So if you want to see the details, we'll put the links down below in the description of this uh, video afterwards. Uh, you can really understand the flow patterns behind the car, how this really changes uh, after each optimization cycle. Uh, you can see the flow patterns through the center of the car and so on. So that was it for our aerodynamic shape optimization overview. Uh, please do, again, uh, do go ahead uh, and look at the data on our website to gain uh, more insights. Other smaller features then, um, I already mentioned the orientation gizmo, which is actually something um, the customers have been asking for, uh, which is to just go to a side view, top view, a rear view, and so on by just one click of a button. So this drone, for example, if you click on the side view, it automatically smoothly switches uh, the view um, from side to top to rear and so on. Another thing I'd like to mention is that we provided a more intuitive interface uh, to understand the differences between a basic 1 million, regular 10 million, and advanced 50 to 100 million mesh. So we now have sliders on our pricing page that will automatically um, show you the difference between an advanced mesh and a basic mesh. And as you can see, the basic mesh it does capture the overall shape of the car, but it really struggles struggles in areas like the wheel rims. Um, it even has uh, the wheels connected to the wheel arches because the resolution is not fine enough to fit cells in between the two. You see that the front grille is only captured uh, as a few fragments. Uh, the resolution, resolution around the front headlights is not spectacular. And if you move to regular, you can see that all of these things are already resolved. Now, if you want to go to a super uh, detailed simulation result, you can use our advanced simulation and you can hardly 
even distinguish individual cells on the surface anymore. It's just that detailed, um, which really allows you to capture small flow structures even around um, these parts on the windows. Uh, you can capture flow separation um, around the, the support structure of the mirrors. You can accurately capture what happens as the flow enters uh, uh, inlet channels uh, for the car and so on. And maybe a short update on our pricing structure. As you may know, our basic calculation is 50 euros, which is mainly used by hobbyists to get a very coarse first insight. Then the main runner that we mostly use of conceptual design work is 500 euros per simulation. And the top one is 2,500 euros per simulation. Now, there are some interesting updates here, uh, which is the next topic I want to mention, which is our subscription. So if you want to go uh, and analyze a full project, um, you can go for our subscription, which is 9,000 euros or $10,500 for 600 credits, which means you can flexibly spend those credits either on simulations, and then the virtual cost of a simulation dramatically goes down to just 15 euros for a basic, 150 um, or $175 uh, for a regular, and 750 um, euros for an advanced simulation, or I believe $900. Um, so first of all, the price really goes down if you work via the credit system. Second of all, you can also use it for optimizations, which normally cost 1,000 for the basic one and 5,000 for the regular one. Um, with a subscription, that goes down to 600 euros for the basic optimization and 3,000 uh, for the regular one. And the cool thing is that a subscription will also provide you with the option to use your credits for consultancy which means that you have a full solution to cover the aerodynamic development of your project, uh, which means that you can use some credits for basic simulation, low resolution at the very early stages. You can increase the resolution at higher, uh, to higher accuracies later on in the development process. And in between those simulations, you can just ask for our consultancy um, to get feedback, to get our assistance uh, and, and tips and tricks on how to actually improve your design. So you have a full A to Z solution for the aerodynamics of your project. Another thing we want to share is that a free version of that subscription, if you can call it that way, is available for teams taking part in the Formula One or F1 in schools um, competition. Now, this is a really nice competition for students at different levels or different grades who are asked to design a Formula One car which is going into in a straight line and they have to reach the finish line finish line as fast as possible and they do so uh, propelled by uh, compressed air cylinders and um, we provide teams that can first of all provide a few social media posts uh, mentioning air shaper and then send us an email via their teacher uh, coming from an official school email address we provide them with eight basic simulations, which they can use to actually analyze and optimize the flow around their car. The cool thing is that the results of these simulations are all made public. So th this list is a list of existing um, Formula One in school projects. You can see there's already quite a lot uh, who have registered. Um, if I go, I maybe just pick a random one final car here. Um, your team can actually see the results of a competing team and actually get inspired and you can learn from each other. So we're kind of creating a, an open source or, or, or open community um, around this um, aerodynamics aspect of Formula One in schools. So this one, for example, clearly illustrates, despite the fact that it's our lowest resolution, that the wheels are generating a lot of drag, um, that you have separation at the rear, uh, that the interface um, between the wheels and the bodywork is also causing separation. Uh, you have an outwash of the air at the lower part of the tire here. Um, <clears throat> the spoiler is not working entirely as it should. Uh, the support struts here are also generating drag and so on. These are all, all learnings you can quickly gather uh, through our uh, F1 in Schools credit package. And it's actually nice to see uh, that because of the intuitive automation, um, we have students of uh, 14 years and younger actually using our platform with success. If you want, there's also a separate video on a team that used our platform to actually advance in terms of rankings and so on. Other things we are currently working on and continuously working on are, for example, our computational times. So we want to get the results to you as fast as possible and reduce our computational costs uh, as much as we can. And this was picked up by Google. They offered us early beta access to 
a new family of AMD EPIC um, CPUs, um, which are integrated in their virtual machines, which is actually a server that we use to run your calculation. And they gave us access after which we started benchmarking and optimizing um, uh, our calculations using these new machines. And we found that they actually improved performance by quite a lot. Um, you can read the details on this case study. Uh, we will drop the link uh, in the comments below. Um, AMD themselves also covered um, this case um, on their own blog. So you can read actually more details on their case because they also provided a full PDF um, with more details on, on which machines we used, what the benefits were, how we actually improved our off um, um, offline machines as well, which we use for development and so on. So if you're interested in this, just check the links uh, in the description after we finish uh, this webinar. Another update is maybe, um, yes, is, is the Im image resolution in our reports. We got questions uh, from customers um, or requests to increase the resolution because Customers often use the images in our reports, which you get for regular and advanced simulations uh, for their marketing purposes, for technical documentation, and so on. Um, we increased resolution to full HD for regular reports and actually to 4K even uh, for advanced simulations. And another update I would like to mention is the logarithmic wind profile. Uh, so normally the input velocity is uniform, which means it's the same velocity at the lowest and the highest point at the beginning of the wind tunnel here. Now for buildings and large structures which are exposed to flows um, in an outdoor climate, what happens in reality is that the flow coming in has a high speed high above the ground and actually slows down as you get closer to the ground as it is being obstructed by objects or even at sea level uh, is sticking uh, to the ground plane level. Uh, and this is called a logarithmic uh, wind profile or, or wind shear profile. And this is actually described in norms and regulations that state which kind of wind profile you should use given a certain area. Um, in Europe, this is described by the Eurocode. So if you go to logarithmic wind profile, we can uh, select a terrain category. And these are described in this code. Uh, with category zero being open sea, nothing as an obstruction at all. Still, you have a wind shear profile. And four being an urban environment with lots of obstructions and slowdowns of the flow. So if you take two, for example, um, we only need to provide the wind speed at 10 meters above the ground, which is the reference velocity. And through that point, we will automatically plot the other points on the velocity curve. So imagine this one is going at 12 meters per second at 10 meters above the ground, which is quite a lot. We can then launch the simulation after we uh, specify the units and so on. So if we then look at the results of this simulation, um, again, we see the normal results. Uh, so I'm now opening up um, an Airshaper simulation report. And if I scroll to one of the last pages uh, where we uh, show the velocity and pressure slides, um, here you can clearly see that I went too far, my bad, just a second. One more, yeah, this should be it. So you can see that the input velocity is no longer a uniform uh, constant velocity. We have low speeds at the bottom and then the air speeds up. You can see it by the color change here and it reaches its highest velocity high above the ground. And this is the logarithmic uh, wind speed profile that we have implemented. So you can now actually comply uh, with those norms and regulations. And that's basically is it for our presentation uh, for today. So I hope you liked it. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat right now. Um, and you can also um, uh, drop comments later on on the video, um, which we will then reply to after we have actually gone through them. Um, I see you have a first question, please. Anyone who has questions, just drop them in the chat and we will uh, get back uh, to you. Um, how much is the Airshaper subscription? So the subscription is a 9,000 euro package or $10,500. And the credits are valid for 12 months. Now, if you still have credits at the end of those 12 months, you can still transfer them to the next year if you extend the subscription and then they are not lost. Um, Lawrence, I hope that uh, answers your question. Um, any other questions that anyone may have? 
I think the audience is a bit more limited compared to our first session, which was early this morning European time. Um, if anyone else, if anyone else has questions, even after you see this recording, uh, when it's being stored or pushed to YouTube, and you're not watching live, uh, just drop your questions below. We will automatically get automatically get notified of your question. Uh, you can also send us an email at info at airshipper.com, and then we will get back to you. So I think that's it. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone, again, for joining this second session. Um, if there's anything else, just let us know. If you have tips or feedback or tips on new features that we should implement in the future, please drop a comment, send us an email, and let us know. Thanks a lot for watching, and talk to you soon. Have a nice day. Bye, everyone.